and Mrs. Herzog's classes here today. But a big, huge thank you goes to Senator Emily Kane from the state of Maine, LHS graduate, class of 98. Um, but you are, I'll come in a little bit so you can see. Um, so you're taking time out of our of your busy schedule of campaigning and talking to guys, talking to our students about um, what life was like for you at Lawrence or transitions and where you went to college and going back with the oh the places you'll go. How the heck you ended up running for Congress? Like such a huge feat for you. So um, just for all of you and the students and Emily, so why don't you just say <coughs> say hi to the class or the students and. Great, thank you so much, Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Herzog, and hello, Mr. Rowe, in the back. Uh, I wanted to, I especially wore my, my Lawrence High School red today, and I wanted to show you that in my office, I keep a little cardinal. Um, and for two reasons. One, because I, I love the mascot, and the other reason is because while I was at Lawrence High School, I was, in fact, the mascot for, for more than three years during the fall football season um, and actually got a varsity cheerleading letter for my mascotting so uh, you can really do anything is what I is what I will say uh, a quick version of how I landed where I am today is it had a lot to do with the fact that right when I was finishing high school right before my senior year my family moved to Maine. My dad got a different job and we had to move. So I stayed in Lawrenceville my senior year, even though my family had moved uh, to Southern Maine and lived with my neighbors, another set of Lawrence High School grads uh, in that family. And, and I stayed to finish high school. And the reason I wanted to stay was because I was involved in so many things at Lawrence. I was extremely involved in mock trial, for example, with Mr. Rowe. Uh, we had many a, many a championship under our belt during those years. I participated in theater, was very involved in the magical chorus and the band, uh, as well as being the high school mascot and, and a, a few other things. So I wanted to stay. And when I finished high school at Lawrence in 1998, I moved to Maine with my family and uh, attended the University of Maine for my undergraduate degree. I majored in music there. Uh, and voice and vocal music education, really inspired by my favorite, uh, I shouldn't say favorite, because there are other teachers I had in the room, but my, uh, probably my biggest mentor I had from Lawrence High School was Richard Stemhagen, uh, who was the music teacher, and he uh, taught me about how music can help you do anything, and so I majored in music, but what I really found through that was my interest was in education, and my interest led me to uh, studying education policy, to earning my master's degree at Harvard in education, higher education policy. And when I came back to Maine, when I finished my master's, I was trying to you know, do some networking to get a job working in, uh, in policy making. And instead, the answer I got was, have you thought about running for office? And the truth was, I, I really hadn't thought about running for office very much. Uh, and I looked at it and thought, I'll give this a try. I was 24 years old when I was first elected to the Maine House of Representatives to represent the community of Orono. I served eight years there, including serving as the chair of the state's budget committee and as the House Minority Leader, the top Democratic leader in the House, before being elected to the Senate last year. And then earlier this year, when my congressman announced he would run for governor, I, see, I saw no reason why I shouldn't put myself forward to run for Congress. And now uh, I'm in full swing as a candidate for Congress, and I, I couldn't be happier. That's a very abbreviated version, and I'm happy to answer questions about any of it. Um, but I will tell you that the skills I use now every day, the things I do are just building upon the many things I learned while I was at Lawrence. I had such an amazing experience at LHS uh, because I have friends that I had there that I still talk with every single week. My very best friend, Janine Tatey, uh, she and I still talk every week at least. Um, I, I keep in touch with teachers that I had there uh, via Facebook and, and other ways and, and I just I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to talk with you because I'm very proud of my Lawrence High School uh, connections and degree and it's really led me to where I am today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Senator Payne. I need to like get out of my vote. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, my connection with um, Senator Kane is we have a very uh, good mutual friend. As I told some of my class, I went to Notre Dame. Um, I only grew up in Lawrence and school. Uh, Seriously. <laughs> Went to Notre Dame, so I've known Senator Kane since uh, we were both in high school. Came here to see you in the plays, musicals, yeah. um, with our mutual friend, and over the years of state, uh, I've been connected. So, and following, you know, history teacher following Senator Kane's um, career track has been amazing. Always blown by it. But I thought maybe we could start with my uh, thought would be some of you. Uh, I'll have note cards come down. Um, you can come down, maybe say, hi, camera's over here, and just say what your name is, um, what grade you're in, uh, whose class you have, um, and then you can ask Ms. Kane some questions. So let's start with Andrew. Come on down. <laughs> hey, Andrew. The camera's right there, so you can see yourself. You can say hi. Hey, Andrew. Hey, uh, my name's Andrew Francis Uh I'm in Ms. Johnson's class. I'm a junior. And uh, I want to know, what do you remember about your time here at LHS? It's a great question. Uh, thank you, Andrew. But what I remember about my time at LHS was how, how much, can you hear me okay? Was how much of a community, of a community I felt in everything that I did. Um, you know, while I, while I did, I, I, had great, I had great teachers and I had great classes, they were um, just as important as the extracurricular things that I did, particularly in theater and music. Uh, and when I, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to think, what do I remember most? I, what I remember most is that I looked forward to going every day because every day was hard, every day was fun. And I, I believe all the teachers that I had wanted to see me do well. Um, I, I never doubted that whether it was Mr. O, or Ms. Herzog, or whether it was Mrs. Clerk, or whether it was Madame Bryan, or Madame Bogart, or any of them, I, I always believed that, that they wanted the best thing for me, and they encouraged me to step outside of my comfort zone. That's how I ended up in mock trial. Uh, it was sort of a challenge, it was almost a dare for me to do that, and, and I took it on. I was stretching my, um, my comfort zone in music, and taking my roles in plays, trying acting, and then I'd probably, and even being the mascot, I, I certainly wasn't an athlete, um, though I am a big fan. And, you know, just being asked to give that a try and someone saying, oh, yeah, I think you could do this, was, was really about challenging me to expand my skill set, not just be good at what was easy, but really try to push myself. Um, and, and those are things, that's, those are skills I still have today. So that's what I remember about my experience, if I had to sort of put a feeling on it, was be, I was challenged to be better all the time and was given the support in order to succeed. The question is, how busy do you tend to stay on an average day? How busy? Um, <laughs> so maybe um, this could be good because you could talk about um, what Ms. Kane uh, has actually taken a leave of absence from her regular day job at University of Maine and devoting full-time efforts to her campaign for um, U.S. Congress. So. So let me talk a little bit like an average campaign day for me. Um, so usually I get up in the morning and I go to the gym. I'll tell you something, something you should learn that I didn't learn until I was 30 was that if you don't protect a little time for yourself every day, someone else will take it. And so I learned, it was just a little over three, about three years ago that I finally said, I'm gonna really start going to the gym. And so I learned the only time of day I could really protect was between 5.30 and 7 a.m. So I get up every day at 5.30, and I go to the gym, um, and I'm usually done by 7, 7.15, and my first meeting is usually at 8 or 8.30, and I almost always start my day with some kind of breakfast meeting, uh, usually someone who wants to help with my campaign, someone who um, has an issue that they're concerned about that they want my help with or want me to know about, or uh, it's with my, my campaign team and my staff as we plan for the day. Then I spend usually a few hours, a couple hours on the phone, uh, making phone calls for fundraising or for events, for political calls, taking press calls. Uh, usually I have some kind of lunch meeting or event uh, to do. I get back on the phone in the afternoon. By late afternoon, I usually have to head to some kind of tour or community event. The, the second congressional district is the largest congressional district. Maine's second congressional district is the largest congressional district geographically east of the Mississippi River. It includes 11 counties, and it is about 80% of the state of Maine. It is way bigger than New Jersey, okay? 
geographically. And so I spend a lot of time in the car, so usually to head to those events, it can be a one to three hour drive before I get to where I'm going in the afternoon. Um, I go to those events for a couple hours. I usually I have to eat at some point, so I do that. Um, and then I usually get back on the phone while I'm in the car on my way back home. And then I land back at my house typically around 10 o'clock where I have a stack of things to sign or e a day worth of emails to respond to. Um, that's like a normal weekday for me. You know, it's a, I'll give you another example. Tonight I'm going to uh, an event that honors a scholarship program in Maine named for United States Senator George Mitchell. And, but then I have to get up at 3.30 in the morning because tomorrow is the start of hunting season. And so I have to attend a hunter's breakfast at four o'clock in the morning in Old Town, then get in my car and drive about 45 minutes north to Penobscot Valley High School where there's another hunter's breakfast in, in, uh, in uh, Howland, and then get in the car and drive another 45 minutes to another one in East Millinock at Medway. So, uh, and that's gonna be all before 9 a.m. Uh, oh, wow. So yeah, it, it, there, I would say it's a new kind of busy, but it's the kind of busy where I know all these things are heading in the same direction, which is I wanna get elected to Congress and I wanna do it with the support of as many people as possible who want to be a part of my campaign. And if I don't ask them to help, if I don't ask them to participate myself, um, then I shouldn't be surprised if they don't show up. So I'm trying to give it 100% all the time. Good question. You can think of me tomorrow morning at about 3.30 when I'm getting ready to go to the hunter's breakfast. Uh, hello, my name is Victor. I'm a senior at the high school and I'm with Ms. Herzog and AP Gov. My question for you is, uh, how do you manage to balance your constituents' needs with the needs of your party? That's a really good question. So the question about constituents versus party, and it's amazing. I, I often talk about, because I've now been in elected office for almost 10 years, and when you're faced with a question of, of voting on any issue, typically you're voting the way you're voting for one of three reasons. Uh, one is because it's what uh, it's what you believe personally, it's your conviction. Another is because it's what your, what your district wants, what's best for your district. And the third reason is because it's what's in line with your party's values. Good legislators, you can never tell the difference because those three things are typically in sync. They are so in touch with their constituents, they're honest with their constituents about how they feel so they can do and, believe, and vote in a way that's good for them, and it's values that are consistent with the party. Um, so I, I think most of the time it's that way. But for me, uh, I always approach difficult questions where those things may be in, um, in conflict or there might be some tension between those three, those three areas. I always approach those from the perspective of that, that I was elected by my constituents and they should be able to trust me to make my best decision. And so I, I typically lean on, on my gut and on what is, the, what is the right thing to do, period. Because there is usually an answer that is very clear. Uh, and, and so yes, yeah, so I'd say that I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big nerd, to be honest with you. I spend a lot of time reading things. I, I try to understand things myself. I don't take things for granted when it's my party or anybody that says, oh, you just have to vote this way, trust me. Um, I tend to do my homework. So I, uh, you know, I can't really think of any votes that I've ever taken where I didn't feel like I could go back to my constituents and say I did the right thing. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Sadia. I'm a junior at Lawrence High, and um, I'm in Ms. Johnson's third period AM Civ 2 class. Um, my question for you was, well, is who writes all your speeches for you? Because I know you do a lot of public speaking and stuff, so yeah. Okay. <sighs> well, I have to actually, I, I probably should blame Mr. Rowe for this a little bit. Because one thing I learned when I was in mock trial was to be in charge of my own words, to be in charge of my own, uh, what I was saying, and to really understand what I was saying. Uh, we used, I, was a, I was a witness in mock trial for both the prosecution and the defense at the same time. And I had to learn um, to always have the facts at my command and be able to articulate them in a way that made sense to people and that were truthful. 
And so I, I will be honest, even though it drives my, my team a little crazy, I like to write my own speeches. Uh, that being said, depending on the topic, I have a team of people that I refer to as a, my kitchen cabinet. A, a term in politics that's often used is the term kitchen cabinet. And that means the group of people that have your back all the time, that will be honest with you, that will give you good advice. And I have a kitchen cabinet with some pretty good speech writers. So I typically take an initial go at the speech um, and then send it around for feedback because I want to make sure I'm not missing anything or you know mixing up any facts. Um, but I like to write my own speeches. I, I like to write my own columns. And, uh, but I also like to send them around for other people to check through. Uh, you know, to be honest, I also don't always like to write them all in advance. Um, another thing I definitely learned in mock trial was how to, how to be, how you make my points. And, uh, and that, that those were the most important things and not to focus too much on, uh, don't get distracted by things that don't matter. So I'm very, very glad to write my own stuff. You know, maybe when I get to Congress, I'll have to have a speech writer. But uh, I think I'll still be in charge of my own words. Um, thanks, uh, Senator Kane. Uh, I'm back. But launching in that, and that you have the team of people that uh, read your speeches. So in your run for U.S. Congressional um, Representative, uh, how do people are working for you? Like, what is your like, what does your staff look like now? You have staff, I guess. Like, how does that? Uh, well, it's a good question. So. I have a core team that's with me every day, literally, uh, usually in the same room. And I, it's a, I have a guy named Levi, who's my finance director, and he's running everything right now. I have a deputy finance director named James. I have a, a scheduler named Allison. I have a call, time, a, a call time manager named Robert. I have five University of Maine students who are working for me right now as interns. I expect I will add more of those in the coming months. We actually are moving into a new office today, which is why I'm doing this call from my house. And um, I, have, uh, I have a team of, of consultants from Washington, D.C. and around the country that work on my polling, that work on mail, that work on TV and radio, and that work on research for my campaign. That makes up about 15 people. And then I have a kitchen cabinet that are, that, uh, that it, are my informal advisors of about a dozen people that I rely on every week to help me make the right choices and stay on top of, oh, of my campaign. And I forgot one. I have a guy named Dan who it does communications for my campaign. So it's a lot of people. And what I was amazed at, you think, you're taking on a campaign, you know, what do you need around you? And what I learned is first and foremost, when you're running a campaign, you can't run much of a campaign if you can't fund a campaign. And so I started with a finance team, a very competent, a very talented and experienced finance team, because I wanted to make sure we got that right. And so far in my race, I've been out raising my opponent two to one and uh, picking up some really exciting national endorsements around that as well. We'll bring on a, a bigger campaign structure in the next few months, um, adding the positions around campaign manager and a field director and probably in the spring we'll add two to three field staff that will be stationed all across the state uh, to help me run my get out the vote. Good question. Hi, Hi. Mrs. Kane. Um, my name is Mutadi. I'm a senior at the high school. Um, I had a question written down but I kind of came up with a new one. Um, would you say that educational issues are the things you are most passionate about? And what kind of education reform have you been involved with in Maine, if at all? Great question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Education policy is definitely what got me started in politics. It's what keeps me going. It's what motivates me every day, even on the hard days, to do this work. Um, it started, you know, didn't just start for me at Lawrence, but when I was in college, you know, for me, I went to the University of Maine, um, not just because it was a good school, but for me, it, it was a lot about finances. Uh, the area of education I spend the most time working on is about affordability of college, access to high quality college and university education for people of all ages, and making sure people can afford it. And so, at the state level, I've done a lot of work, um, just this year passed a bill um, around student loans to enable Maine banks to offer better rates on student loans for Maine families, supported the Maine State Grant Program, 
funding for our higher education, their base budgets for research and development. Uh, because I know for me, affording college was really hard. Um, it, you know, it, it, it frustrated me that uh, it was really because of money that, that my, my choices were limited. And that, and that was with my parents helping me. Um, and so I, I met a lot of students in college in similar places that, to me where affording college was tough but getting that education and those skills was so important. So it, it's important to me in my public work that that's always top of mind. And so I'm always doing things to try to connect business and education, to try to make employers understand the importance of workforce development and investing in their employees with better skills and, and more education so that they can grow the workforce. Uh, and, and also um, looking at questions for what are the other barriers facing particularly first generation college students which Maine has a lot of uh, not just affordability but an understanding of how to navigate that system when I think about the federal level in Washington uh, and the problems that are there I think we have many good pieces in place that have are not keeping up with the times the Pell Grant for example Pell Grant is something if you don't know what that is is what you get uh, for the most low income people to, to go to college to help you pay for college. When the Pell Grant was originally started, it was supposed to cover 75% of the cost of college. Today, you're lucky if it, if it covers 20 or 25% of the cost of college because the program itself hasn't kept up with the times. Um, so I'm concerned about that. And I'm also concerned about a lot of the ways we incentivize going to college. I think we put too much emphasis on loans and uh, you know going to to schools that are not affordable, that don't necessarily give you a better education. And at, we've done it at the expense of public higher education, which to me is, is just so important to growing the future. So I, I, I've done a lot of that work. It's top of my mind every single day. And I found myself turning it into not just education policy, but ed economic development policy, business priorities, and budget priorities. Great question. I'm from Ms. Johnson's class, I'm a junior, Great. and I wanted to ask you, do you want to work your way up in positions, maybe to president, or what's the position that you aspire to be? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't really know president, I don't know about president, I, I mean, we'll see. Um, no, I, I gotta answer that question in two ways. Number one is that I feel very lucky to be running for the position I'm running for now, and if this is, you know, to me, public service has not been about climbing a ladder or just trying to get to the next position. The only reason, for example, I moved from the state house to the state senate in Maine is because we have term limits. I'm not allowed to serve more than four terms. So I ran for the senate because I wanted to keep doing the work. To me, it's always been about the work. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not something you do because it you because you get famous or you have a big fortune. It, it's because you care about people. And so for me, running for the United States Congress, if I had the opportunity to serve Maine in the U.S. Congress, uh, that could be my ultimate. That could be where I am happiest as long as I feel like I am challenged and I am making a difference. Uh, but I, I, that being said, I would certainly, um, if the time was right, welcome the opportunity to run for United States Senator for Governor. Uh, or, or other type positions. But, you know, uh, um, on the non-elected side, my career goal, uh, besides being a Broadway star, which has always been my actual career goal, is to have a career singing, um, but is to be a college president. In addition to the work I'm doing now, I'm doing my PhD part-time at the University of Maine, studying higher education and economic development and public policy because I believe so strongly in this work. And when I finish being in politics, I think I'd like to go back because I want to I want to keep working on these issues of access, affordability, and economic development in higher education. Wow. But I will say, if I run for president, I'm counting on all of you to head up, you know, New Jersey for Kane, okay? Oh, you know I will. <laughs> <laughs> the aware campaign manager. Hi. Hey, stranger. You look exactly the same. Oh, sorry to hear that. <laughs> it's so good to see you. And I just want like these kids to learn from your experience here at the high school. Yeah. This was the most outgoing.
positive young lady I've never, ever, ever met in my life. I've been here 25 years. If you want to learn something, she made the most out of every day. She was always happy, always picking other people up. And I always knew she was destined for great things. And I just want to tell you, I have no question, I just want to tell you how proud oh, I am. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am so darn proud of you. And I don't want to hear about this Congress, college president. You're going to be president of the United States. All right? All right? <laughs> well, don't sell yourself short. You're going all the way. And I'm going to be you part of your it. kitchen cabinet. Don't forget me. All right? You're in. You're all right. in. I love you. That's so nice. <laughs> does he, does he still <laughs> slam books on the table during class? <laughs> Bye, Who's next? Bye, Mr. Rowe. Hi, I'm TT. I'm a senior in Mr. Herzog's Gov class. I can't really follow what Mr. Rowe said, but um, I have a question that went with Matadi's about education. Um, I know you're talking about higher education, but what do you think should be done about like K through 12? And what role do you think the federal government will play? And how do you think that'll affect you as a congresswoman? Thank you, Gigi. That's a great question. Uh, because really, the reality of education is you can't separate K through 12 from higher ed now. It, it's essential that students have the ability to move from higher from high school to college and to get those other skills they need to be successful in the workforce and in life. Um, so to me, I think K through 12 um, has been sort of bogged down with a lot of with a lot of testing. Uh, we've seen it here in Maine with a lot of frustrated teachers who aren't getting more resources, but who are getting more evaluations and who are being told, you know, how, told they have to be measured by things that aren't necessarily in the best interest of students or really about learning. Um, I, I talk with a lot of teachers who are so frustrated that you know they're buying supplies for their own classes with their personal money and they're spending their weekends getting ready for class. And you know, and then they get to class and they're told, oh, you're, you know, you actually have to teach this this way, and that, and that's really frustrating. So to me, I, I think the shift needs to be about empowering teachers to do what they do well and to do what they do best. Because I, I've never really experienced a situation where you couldn't trust a teacher to make the right decision for kids. And so I, I think that's one of the things we need to be focusing on teachers and their role in the classroom. Uh, I think funding is definitely part of it. Uh, in Maine, we have a lot of, of small rural schools that are the lifeblood of their communities. That we can't we can't afford to close them because they are the, the life of the school. Uh, and the, excuse me, the school is the life of the town. Um, and so, one of the things we look at in Maine is how do we make sure kids, whether they live in the middle of Washington County in a very rural place, or they live in Androscoggin County in downtown Lewiston. How do you make sure those kids both get the same experiences, or not experiences, at least the same skills, so that they can all go on to college in the same way? Uh, so I think funding is part of it. I think the way we look at standards is important. Uh, Maine is participating at the national level in what our uh, national standards are in education. We've been participating in that. And that's been a positive experience for us as a state to build professional development and to build uh, opportunities for teachers and students to learn and to grow. So I, I, I think, the, and the other thing I would say is that connection between high school and college, uh, making sure students know how to move from one to the next and have the skill sets that students are college ready. In Maine, we have a very high high school graduation rate for the country. It's about 78, almost 80% usually uh, that finish. And then, but you know, not even 30% of them often go on to college. And so it's important for us to think about why is that happening? Is it that they're not ready? Is it that the high school diploma doesn't mean you're ready to go to college? Um, and if so, what's wrong with that? We need to be looking at that. Um, or is it that you know colleges aren't talking to high schools enough? So I, I think it is a seamless system. We have to think about pre-K through really uh, through 20. Thank you. So, yeah, when I first was elected at 24, uh, I was not only the youngest member of the legislature that year in Maine, um, but I was one of only five people under the age of 35, I think, and, uh, and only about 24% of the Maine legislature, maybe 27% were women. Um, the reality of women in politics is that only about 
25% of state legislators are women. It, it gets worse at the congressional level with just under 20% of Congress being uh, made up of women, when women actually make up more than half the population and more, more than half of college graduates and college going students today. Uh, it, it is a um, proven fact through research that when you say to a young woman, maybe one of you sitting in the room, do you think you'll run for office someday? You will typically respond, I don't know, maybe, oh, we'll see, I'd like to help someone. But if, I, if you ask, typically if you ask one of the men in the room, they'll say, yeah, probably, I'd do that, sure. And a lot of it is just is because you don't see yourself there. You don't, you don't get to see women in politics all the time. So have I experienced discrimination? I would say yes, I have, uh, definitely. But not necessarily um, ill will. I, there, there are very few people I've encountered who are mean and nasty and don't want to include someone because they're a woman. What I encounter more are people who uh, haven't necessarily been at the table with, with women in positions of power. And so they don't necessarily know how to act. Um, the, uh, you know, for me, I always look at those moments as teaching moments, as an opportunity to change the paradigm. For example, for, if all of you today, if you don't remember anything at all about what I say or who I am, what I hope you remember is that a young woman can run for Congress, or that a young person can run for Congress. And I hope you can see a little bit of yourself, me, doing this, and know that you can do the same thing. Uh, so I have dealt with discrimination. It's amazing how when you run for Congress as a woman, and I've asked my male friends who have run for Congress if this happens to them, the number one thing people want to talk about is what I wear. It's crazy. You know, Emily, you really should wear more blazers. You really should wear different shoes. You really should make sure that, you know, that your makeup is this, or your this is this is that, or don't wear too much of this color. And it's like, really? How about we talk about issues and policies and challenges facing our state. But the difference is, I think women, um, women in politics face more issues around appearance and perception. Uh, and I think it's just a reality right now. And I'm, I'm happy to be part of pushing on that glass ceiling as much as possible. Uh, and again, trying to be part of changing those preconceived notions and changing those uh, negative stereotypes that lead people to make poor choices um, when dealing with women in politics. I will also say, the state of Maine has one of the proudest histories in the country of women in politics. The first woman in the United States Senate who was elected on her own right was Margaret Chase Smith. She is famous. If you don't know who she is, you should look her up. She's worth a few minutes of your time. Uh, she was a Republican running in the, she was, had served in the second congressional district where I'm running now. And she was famous, became famous for a speech she gave of the Declaration of Conscience during a time of McCarthyism when there was uh, a lot of fear mongering going on around the country. And she stood up and said, no, that's not okay, uh, no matter who you are. So we've had her, we've had United States Senator Olympia Snow, who is just recently retired, current United States Senator Susan Collins. We have uh, State Rep uh, United States Representative Shelley Pingree from Southern Maine. So Maine has a strong record of women in Washington, that's for sure. And it would be my privilege and my, my honor to serve in their footsteps. Hi, um, my name is Eamon, and um, I'm Ms. Johnson's student. Um, my question for you is, do you believe Affordable Care Act will be worse for America? I couldn't hear you, you said, it, do I believe in what? Do you believe Affordable Care Act will be worse for America? Thank you. Um, the Affordable Care Act, or uh, as it's called popularly as Obamacare, uh, I think, I think is, is having some serious bumps in the road right now. I will say I, I believe in the intent, I believe in the direction behind the Affordable Care Act. I think it's important that we work on the health care system in our country, particularly around changing um, the way things are paid for, controlling costs. We need to put more emphasis on wellness and prevention. I think the Affordable Care Act has already had some major accomplishments, including extending coverage to students up to age 26, who are, to people age 26 who are on their parents' coverage, 
expanding the number of things that are mandated to be covered uh, by insurance, particularly for women like uh, mammograms and different cancer screenings that will literally save lives uh, right away. Uh, but there's no doubt that what's been happening in the news uh, for, the past, for the past month around implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the health care exchanges is, is just so frustrating. I mean, it's just been a, it's been a disaster when it comes to implementation. And so I, I'm not ready, I'm not going to give up on what the Affordable Care Act is trying to accomplish in the way of getting more people access to insurance and getting more people access to affordable health care in our country. Um, but I'd say that, uh, man, they really messed up this, this implementation. And so I think in the long run, uh, direction is good. I think that the challenges they're having right now with implementation are really, um, are, are extremely problematic and, and are making it hard for people to actually see what good is coming in the law. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm in Ms. Herzog's uh, Gov class. I'm a senior now. And I was just wondering uh, how much um, say the party has in the primary system. Like, when you're going up against someone who's, does the party throw its power behind one candidate? And how much, um, how much uh, help, how, how does that power yeah. really affect the race and the complexion of how that? That's a great question. And by the way, I love your shirt. That is cool. Uh, yes. Super Lawrence. Um, so, uh, thank you. In Maine primaries, uh, in Maine, the Democratic Party does not choose sides in Democratic primaries. Uh, not in recent history, and I would imagine it would, it would be uncommon for them to do so. Uh, and certainly in my primary, they have not. I'm currently running in a three-way race. Uh, with myself, another state senator who's from way up north, and then a guy who uh, I don't know very well, who's from a pretty rural part of the state, uh, who's not as well known. And then we're waiting to see if another guy is going to get in. So at this point, the party is staying out. Uh, where the party is focusing its efforts, I'll give you an example in the, uh, in the governor's race. We have a governor that we really don't like. Um, and we want to replace him with the congressman who I'm running to replace. And there was a, there were some potential primary candidates there. And I think you know, the party facilitated some conversations to say, look, if we want to, if we all agree we want to, you know, have a new governor, let's try to put our efforts behind one person. And that was they were successful in doing that. But in an open congressional seat, they, they don't really, um, they're not playing a role at this time. What I will say is there are organizations and groups around the country and in the state who do take sides in primaries. I'm very proud to be a fully endorsed candidate at the national level with a group called Emily's List, not named for me, uh, but a group that supports Democratic women running for higher office. Uh, that's a big deal, puts me in touch with a national network of uh, potential funders as well as campaign advice, and also a group called the Women's Campaign Fund, which is a bipartisan group. Uh, so I'd say generally, in Maine anyway, and I can't speak for New Jersey or other places, the party party politics, the party organization itself, um, provides the same support to all candidates running in the primaries, but then once it's time for general election, once that primary is done in June, then it's full speed ahead and they've got your back completely. More questions coming for you. Great. Um, hi, my name's Thomas. I'm a senior in Ms. Herzog's class. I was just curious, and what's your biggest fear in terms of representing an entire state in the Congress, and how are you going to represent like the, the divided opinions of the state? Thank you. It's a great question. Uh, something I've done some thinking about. Uh, my biggest fear in representing such a large district is that um, you always want to look out for the best interest of the district. And when you're running a district like I am, which is so large and so diverse in background, in, in industry, in economic opportunity, in, uh, in really all kinds of opportunities different across the state, and, and the industries that they rely on. Um, so for me, I'm always going to be looking at 
what's in the best interest of the people in the district, and who is this going to impact um, positively and negatively? I think you always have to look at, at both sides. You know, there are, um, there are very different needs. What, what I would say about the district, as I've traveled around the district, is that what, what the places and the people need right now might differ. You know, for example, some may need more jobs in manufacturing. Others might want to grow their economy by, you know, they're frustrated that people aren't living where they are. Others are challenged by environmental issues. Others are challenged by things, you know, Maine's economy is so built on farming, on fishing, and on forestry that environmental factors play a huge, a huge role here, for example. And so uh, sometimes you might find a group on one end of the state that really cares about one thing as their top priority, and it's the exact opposite of people in another part of the state. So I think for me, it's about a constant look at who is this impacting, and how does it forward the overall goal that we all agree on, which is we want the state of Maine and the second congressional district to grow economically, to be a place where people can come and stay and live and stay and raise families and have jobs and have great schools. Um, and everybody wants that. So I, I'm always checking things with what's the impact now and, and what's the impact later. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, my name is DJ. Uh, I'm a junior in Ms. Johnson's class. And my question is how important is social media to you? Because I know right now we have a couple of people who are looking up your Twitter. And oh. <laughs> so, you know, follow us back. And okay. <laughs> Good question. So, a couple things. When you're young, when you get elected to the house, of the state house, and you're 24 years old, you become, um, and really, I was one of the very first members of the main legislature to have a Facebook page. Uh, and I just really just used our personal pages at that point. If you were to find me on Facebook, uh, you can find me on my personal account, which is Emily Kane, C-A-I-N, um, and my my congressional page is Kane for Congress, C-A-I-N F-O-R Congress. And um, but but I'll tell you is when you start young in politics and you have a Facebook page, Facebook puts a limit on the number of friends you can have. So I have five thousand friends on Facebook, and that's as many as you're allowed to have. So if I want to add someone, I have to delete somebody else. It's like my own personal game of Survivor, right? <laughs> somebody gets voted off the island so somebody else can come back on. That's a silly thing. But so if you are on Facebook, check out, I think I've came for Congress and like that page and, and you can get updates there. Twitter, I'm using, uh, Twitter was a, sort of a New Year's resolution for me that I was going to use Twitter personally. Uh, then I decided to run for Congress and now I have, so I have a personal, Twitter, uh, Twitter account, which is at Emily Ann Kane, A-N-N, and I have my at Kane for Congress, which is the congressional uh, Twitter. Um, and then we are, uh, we're building our website. So I have those things in, in motion. What I would say from a, what is important about social media and why is it important? And it's really important because of who I want to connect with and how I want people to stay engaged. Maine is a state that, um, if you live in a rural area and you have uh, access to the internet, Facebook is important to you. And the internet's important to you because it's how you get your information. It's, it's a lot closer than your library. It's a lot closer um, than you know, the, the university or something that might be nearby. So I use Facebook and Twitter to, uh, to, to mostly promote things the campaign is doing, to spread messages about the earned media we're getting in the newspaper or on TV and to just continuously build awareness about uh, how the campaign is doing and build, build supporters. The other thing is the more people you have connected to you that way, the more people are repeating your information and getting the word out about your campaign all the time. Uh, so we, we like to try to ask people to share or retweet things as much as possible. But the other thing that happens when you become a congressional candidate is they don't let you run your own Twitter account anymore all the time. So I own and I take care of my own at Emily and Kane and Emily Kane on Facebook, but my Kane for Congress page and Twitter account, uh, I do not have the password for it because um, they like to make sure that those things are on message and I am not the most proficient tweeter. So please follow me on those places. Uh, it is, it's very important. It's also important for national networks. Uh, national fundraising or awareness networks are really connected via social media um, 
And, and I think particularly because I have a lot of universities and colleges in my district, it's important to stay connected because I want to make sure young people are connected to my campaign. Good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm ah. Matthew. I'm in Ms. Herzog's AP Gov class. I was just wondering how being in our political system has changed your view on it, if it has at all. That's a really, that's an interesting question. So how has being in the political system changed my view of it? Um, I would say for me, and I appreciate what Mr. Rowe said about how I was, I'm, I'm a very positive person. I think that's still true today. I will say being a part of government, being an elected official now for almost a decade, and hoping to do it at a bigger level at the United States, in the United States Congress, has really, for me, um, made me more of a believer that government has an important role to play in people's lives. Government doesn't have to be, be your mother and your father, it doesn't have to be, take care of you all the time, but I believe government should be there to take care of things that are important, things like roads and bridges, things like making sure schools are good. I believe government should play a positive role in people's lives. That doesn't mean it has to be big, that doesn't mean it has to be ominous and have uh, incredible overwhelming regulation, but I believe government needs to be there for you, whether it's to help you succeed and whether it's to grow your business or get more education, or whether it's to, to be there for you when, when bad things happen and you need a helping hand with healthcare or housing or food. Um, and, and for people who are disabled or who are elderly. Uh, so for me, it's, it's actually made me much more positive about the role that government should play. I will say, however, being in government has also made me much more critical of those who want to tear government down. Um, and when government isn't functioning, it just drives me crazy. When I look at what's happened in Washington, if you just look at the last eight weeks, when you look at the shutdown, when you look at how that happened, why that happened, um, to me, that is, you know, you look at sequestration. You know what sequestration is? That's where the federal budget is now just automatically taking reductions out of things because they didn't want to make decisions and set priorities. I think sequestration is lazy legislating. That is bad policy making. That is not how things should work. And so when I, when I think about what, why I do this, um, it's because I believe government should play a positive role, and I think uh, we should all expect that from government at all levels, and that's why people need to get involved. That's why I want to be involved, that's why I want you to be involved, um, and that's why when I go to Congress, that's what I want, I want to be a part, I mean, I think the pendulum in D.C. has swung too far out to crazy land in a lot of places. It's like crazy town, you know? And I think that pendulum needs to swing back towards normal. And I want to make sure I can be there and be there long enough to help make that happen. I was curious uh, about um, when you look at Maine compared to New Jersey, I remember hearing something about how northern Maine is very different from southern Maine. Uh, when you look at the constituencies, politically, are they more liberal versus conservative, or also or is it more polarized climate or more moderate climate? Like I think of Olympia Snow from Maine. So I'm curious what you have to say about that. Great question. Um, the second congressional district is definitely uh, it's the largest part of Maine, it's the most rural part of Maine, and compared to the first congressional district, uh, you know, Maine is a much more, uh, first, the southern part of the state tends to be more democratic to liberal almost, and their politics reflect that, their elected officials reflect that. The second congressional district is a, is a district that, unlike places around the country, has not been redistricted to be solid red or solid blue. It actually is a race we expect that will get national attention because it's a race where the demographics are, are pretty close between Republicans and Democrats. That we're expecting a lot of national interest in this seat in 2014. Um, so what I find, when you think about Maine's demographics, and here's what's big difference. I'm gonna tell you some facts about Maine that will make you go, what? Um, so for example, Maine is either number one or number two uh, the whitest state in the nation. <laughs> Seriously. And it's not because Maine isn't a place that welcomes everyone. It's not because Maine is a place that isn't tolerant or doesn't have communities uh, that support one another. It's because Maine is Maine and it's, you know, it's north and just, it's just a fact. 
And uh, so that's a really interesting challenge we have demographically. Maine is also the oldest state in the nation, uh, which means we have very specific needs around healthcare infrastructure and around making sure that um, older citizens can live here, retire here, and, and age here gracefully. That's a big challenge. But at the same time, Maine has a, you know, a, has a large number of colleges and universities with young people that want to stay here. So I tend to end up, up in a lot of conversations with younger people and older people, both talking about what do they want from Maine? What do we want to see in 10 years or 20 years? Um, and being able to bridge that divide is one of the biggest challenges I have. From a partisan perspective, Maine has a Republican Senate, United States Senator and an Independent. We have two Democrats, one um, more moderate, one more progressive in the United States House. We have a Democratic legislator and a Republican governor. Um, so we're pretty split down the, down the middle. Maine is a very independent state, uh, and I expect it will stay that way. And that's why, for me, uh, well, well, even while I'm running my primary, I'm making sure that I'm keeping an eye on the fact that I, I have relationships with Republicans and independents that I'm going to need. Uh, because voter-wise, the state of Maine is a third, a third, and a third. It's a third Democrats, it's a third Republicans, and it's a third unenrolled or independents. So you have to make sure you're appealing broadly or you won't get elected. And I wanted to say a couple things if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Real quick. Right. Yeah. Number one, any of you can do what I'm doing. And you don't have to major in political science. You don't have to be in student government. You just have to care. You have to show up to do the work and you have to want to put yourself out there. And so whatever your interest is, please put on your list of things you're going to do someday is consider running for office. Because you can do this and you can do it in a way that will make a difference. And, and number two, for all of you, you should all consider coming to the University of Maine in Orono. It's a great place. I would be happy to personally give you a tour if you come to visit, and you can work on my campaigns uh, for years to come uh, if, if you come here. Maine is a wonderful place, it's a wonderful state, uh, and I, I hope you visit if, if you're not going to come to the University of Maine. Um, and number three, I just want to say thank you. I wasn't kidding when I said the person I am today, I wouldn't be who I am today or have the skills and beliefs I do today if it weren't for the amazing experience I had at LHS. The friends I made, the teachers I had, uh, the adventures that we had in that four-year period of time are still with me. And I keep, I'll keep my little card on my desk and think of all of you uh, often. And so thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to keeping in touch. And uh, make sure you think of me during this campaign season because I'm going to need all the support I can get.